But we also heard in our morning panel that really anything humans create can open up the door to the transcendentals. So the big vision for this panel, for me speaking as a sociologist who has drifted into moral philosophy and now into practical theology, I think one thing, one idea that really transformed me as I began to read more moral philosophy was that what does literature, fiction, poetry, film writing as an art form have to do with the sacred and with our shared identities? Um, so that's kind of a big overarching question to this. And I thought maybe we could just take a moment and have each of you let the audiences know a little bit about some of your work and how you see the work that you're doing contributing somehow to restoring a sense of the sacred, building a shared identity, and addressing some of the deep concerns and problems that we were talking about in the earlier panel about whether or not people are even ready to, to be able to enter into, into beauty. So maybe I will start um, on the end of the row. Maybe I'll start with, with James. Uh, I, I started writing early and started writing fiction and went to study in the Hopwood Program at the University of Michigan, uh, intending to be a, a novelist and was had written a great number of short stories and and uh, and was finishing my first novel when I was a runner up for the Frederick Exley fiction contest at GQ magazine, which a friend of mine had placed in the year before and had gotten a three book deal out of it. So I thought I'm on the cusp of becoming a novelist. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't losing the Exley that, that cursed me. It was rather um, hearing a professor try to explain how iambic pentameter worked um, <laughs> as, he, as he spoke of blank verse and, and, the, and, uh, and the pentameter line, I sat there thinking, how do you do this? How do you count syllables? in such a way as to make them form a line of verse. And I don't remember the rest of the day's lesson because I sat there trying to write this line, a sonnet every day for five long years. It took, took the rest of the class just to write that line. I went home that night and wrote 13 more lines over the course of five hours. And when I was done, I had a sonnet um, and went running down the halls of the dorm room to show it to all my friends. Look what I've done. It's, it, it was it was truly an epiphany of making. It was uh, it, this seems to be the greatest thing I had ever done. Um, and I had I had worked in construction and built things uh, as a, uh, as in, in high school. So I was used to making things, but this seemed like a miracle of making. There was some that I entered into a kind of mystery. Um, I came home from class the, for the next four nights, and every night spent five hours writing another sonnet, uh, which ended up being about a guy who lives on the Jersey Shore drinking himself to death because he's upset about the election of Ronald Reagan. Who knows where that came from? <laughs> <laughs> I was from my early years a great passionate admirer of Ronald Reagan, so I just don't know where that came from. But, um, uh, but what that encounter with the mystery of putting words in order um, said to me is that the act of human making is not creative. It's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of ontological discovery. It's, um, the act of making involves the act the, and the practice of any craft involves a kind of conformity of the will to nature to bring something into being that wasn't there, but, but, but can only come to to be through the cooperation of laws that you don't know yet. And that it's the act of making that teaches you the laws that you're obeying. Um, why, why this matters is, is, is uh, in the terms of my own biography anyhow, is, is that um, I had a, a wonderful group of, of uh, fiction writers with whom I, um, we critiqued each other's stories in my apartment one night a week. Um, and, uh, and we didn't have a whole lot in common except for two convictions. One was that craft mattered, and it mattered for the reasons I just suggested. And that craft well done could transform your life. That art, as the great sonnet of Rilke, uh, the archaic torso of Apollo ends, you must change your life. To, to encounter 
a well-made thing of beauty uh, throws down a gauntlet to the human soul to, to perceive the world more accurately and to live differently in consequence. Um, I don't want to put too much of an emphasis on the live differently in consequence because, um, because what that encounter is is not primarily moral. It's primarily <coughs> ontological. That is to say, it's an encounter with reality, which is why, and, it's, and, and an encounter with being can lead us in all kinds of uh, directions. You know, Terry Eagleton once said that the, um, that the people who were great advocates of the moral uplift of literature, when they went into Auschwitz and found the guards had been reading Goethe, they suddenly had some explaining to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think uh, that's true. And the explanation is that, um, is that evil is part of an encounter with being. And, uh, and so the encounter with, with works of art is not, uh, doesn't have a clearly defined moral valence. It's, it's a more profound mystery than that. Encountering merely at this humanistic level, this level of, of the act of making, the way in which the made thing suddenly places demands upon us made me see slowly that the great humanistic aspiration is just to do a good job, to make something good, open inevitably onto the more profound mystery of the origin of things. Um, which is why, on the one hand, I'm a great believer in craft as its own end that the artist's task is to just make a good work, but that uh, there's a kind of irreducible tethering of that act of making to, um, to the life of the spirit and the transformation of the soul to become adequate to, um, to being and being itself. 